everybody. Welcome back to the Genesis Ag Podcast. We're joined again with special guest, super special guest, extra special guest, Philip Davis. So, Philip, one of the things that has been occurring in the industry more over time is the acceptance that maybe biology isn't such a magic out there foo-foo type science, and maybe there's something to this. You've been on the forefront of chasing this biological dragon for longer than I've known you. How can, can you sum up maybe how the industry's changed from your vantage point as being someone who was an early adopter, an innovator, and a proponent of this type of technology and this type of mindset? I guess to answer that, uh, back at the start of my being somewhat conscious of what farming was about, we, they were some guys that um, did some far out things and according to what the industry would accept at that time. And we could look back in the sixties as early as I can remember. And, and some of those guys were, were talked about in the industry then because they, they were pretty much a hundred percent manure applications. They worked even back then with uh, cover crops, even though those cover crops were, were turned under with a moldboard plow. Uh, then they would work the ground, plant their crop and, 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 and some of the industry kind of poked at them a little bit because they didn't use a high rate of nitrogen. They didn't use you know, a lot of synthetic fertilizers. Then in the 70s, it kind of got the word sustainability kind of got kicked around a little bit. And, and uh, I remember uh, some of the first uh, Acres conferences that, that, that I attended, some of the first uh, uh, no-till conferences. I, I went to the first no-till conference that, that, uh, that the industry uh, put out, and uh, that was national no tillage. And um, some of the speakers that were brought forth in some of these had some really far out ideas, and and they talked more about s- sustainability, and they started talking about uh, soil biology. And uh, so. I had a privilege back in the uh, mid eighties of, of working here because of my presence in the, in no-till of working with, uh, through the NRCS, they had a program where working with Elaine Ingram that you could take a sample of your soil and you next date it and, and put it with ice packs to her lab then she would give you a biological reading back of what was present in your your soil. So that was some of my first taste into this. And as I've said before, Mike, we we tried some of the these brews where we tried to to generate a biological food, and we have uh, have done compost teas. We've we've brewed things for seventy two hours. Had to keep it at 72 degrees and jump through all these hoops and you had to put a food source with it. So we, we used some blackstrap molasses to kind of stimulate the biology that was in this compost tea. And we've been through there and done all that and worked with humic acids way back when they were really super nasty and you couldn't hardly get them to go through a filter. And if you had orifices in your planter, it was a nightmare because you were out cleaning your little orifice filters and everything, and you couldn't see your monitors at that time because it was so black you couldn't see. You know, I'll, I'll use the, the, the no, we were using the red ball monitors and you couldn't even see it. And so a lot of times you were, when I say planning blind, you were hoping that you were, were getting stuff and, uh, whether it be looking at your tank to see if it was still going down or what have you. But so, you know, that's some of my first experiences with, with biology and how to stimulate biology. But mine has been through the, the world of 
hard knocks. I, I'm not really been into a, a really good biological uh, training class or uh, where I spent four years of learning about soil biology. I've been fortunate to meet some really key people that have helped me and have uh, taught me some of the things that, that I truly believe. And the main thing, Mike, is, is your experience. It's like I tell someone, if you've experienced something, no one can argue with that. They may not be able to duplicate it on their farm, but if you've experienced that and you saw that, that transition take place, uh, no one can argue with it. They may not agree with you, but if that's been your experience, I can't take your experience away from you. It's, it's what you've uh, uh, really encountered on your own farm, uh, you've learned on your own farm, and et cetera. So that's really kind of where I'm coming from. And where we're wanting to go today is uh, we feel like we're, we're somewhat advanced from where we were 20 years ago. And we've learned a lot and, and bringing that about that it being a key component of yield. Um, and, and you've heard me say this many times. Your yield is your soil biological capacity to release nutrients from that crop that you're growing. And that's it, period. If you don't have the biology there, yeah, you can you can artificially stimulate that plant some, but it's very limited how much you can artificially stimulate. It has that biology has to be there. So, Mike, here here's some of the things that I've experienced in this this time period. We would first get a a product that came into the industry and I mixed, I mentioned fulvic and humic acid and, and how that's kind of transitioned now into a much cleaner, much uh, user friendly product than what it was 20 years ago. Can you explain how they've changed that Philip, what they've done to clean that up? Well, a lot of the suppliers of that technology have learned that, it's more than just sending a, a very crude uh, uh, product out to, to us as producers. And how that's changed is they, they've, they've, they've heard of all the heartaches, the horror stories, product that they've had to take back because someone says, I'm not using that mess anymore. And so they've refined a lot of it. The industry has itself that, that so when I say they were trying to get it more soluble, uh, easier to deliver uh, through our uh, infra starters or two by two, uh, whatever it may be, as they've learned that that they have to get that where it's more user friendly. So that's been a huge advancement uh, alone in that is just getting getting that product more user friendly. Also, in the beginning, when we would get a product, it would have a very short shelf life. And uh, if, if we got, uh, it's like some of these compost teas that we've actually brewed on our farm. We only had a certain, when it, when it, when the brew got finished, you only had a certain number of hours that you could get that applied or all your bugs were dead. So it was a very short window. Then when, companies start to say, well, I've got bugs in the jug. And you say, okay, how are, how are they living in that jug? You, you heard a very wide range of how they're keeping their bugs alive in, in, their, in the jug. Um, I think now the industry has, has gotten much better in the last 20 years of where, where we started with this. In getting the producer, getting the consumer a really good quality product that if we're saying there's X number of Zotobacter or uh, Rhizobia or whatever it may be, that they're there. And I think in some of the earlier technologies, if we left it sitting in the pickup, uh, in the sunlight hit the jug, they were probably already dead if it had been on on, on our pickup for four or five days and got into 100 degrees or 
in the jug. I think a lot of that technology is advanced, but all of those are still things that we as producers, as consumers of these products still need to be aware of. And it is, it is live biology. So we need to treat it that way and not just throw it around in any way to, uh, and disrespect actually the biology itself. These are fat cattle. They're not feeders. You got to treat them with kid gloves. Right. Right. Mike. Same, same deal. Going to market. Right. Right. Well, Philip, I know your products. One of the things that you do to differentiate your products is you don't have to use them within two to five hours. You don't have to be as gentle with them. You still have to treat them with uh, you know, a little bit of care, but are you able to speak to what you've done with your biology, how you've addressed it, those issues, and what do you think the limits are on how far we can take making these products more user-friendly? I guess to, to answer that, Mike, as far as how far we can take them, I'm probably more excited today than I've been in the industry working with some of the people I'm working with about where we can take this and what we can actually do with this. Um, one of the most exciting things, and, and I'm, I'm working with a group, and, and our goal would be to cut inputs by 50%. And I know that that people listening are going to say, well, how are you going to do that? But we are currently been able to do that on several farms. And we've got long-term studies going in uh, in 2020 on new farms that we've never been on before to try to try to prove that, to see if we, if we can do that. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm overly excited about that. So you're asking me where I feel like we can take that. I, I don't know. I mean, it may be in one day that, that you've got a something that, that looks like a, an alka seltzer or whatever, and you throw that in a spray tank and after it, it, it does its deal, you're, you're gone. And, you know, is that coming? I, I would say that the potential of that, but where, where we want to be as a company is we want to be sure that whatever comes in our jugs that's got the Genesis Ag name on it and it gets to your farm, that at that time, that whatever's in that jug has a very high potential of bringing to you what you envision that product to do. We want to provide the training at Genesis A to, to help you understand this is what this product can do and this is how it works and this is how it functions. If you want that experience on your farm, we, we really feel like we have a very high level of success of bringing that to you and you being able to experience that. We're learning that some of our technology has limitations. When I say, you know, when we first started this business five years ago, I thought some of it was bulletproof. We're finding out now that it may be bulletproof, but you put it in a certain environment and, and it's going to remain dormant because it has no reason to get activated. There's no companion product there. There's no companion uh, energy source, therefore. So it's going to say, why should I germinate? I'll use the word germinate. You know, they say a cucumber, uh, and I know you guys don't have those out there, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen one. <laughs> yeah, but but they say they can, can, I forget how many years, it's like 25 years that that seed can remain in the soil till it's right for it to germinate, and then it, and then it will germinate. So, uh, it's much like that. If, if this biology doesn't, doesn't, when I say it's intelligent enough to know that, hey, I'm not gonna spend a lot of energy, I'm not gonna to, to, to waste it. That's why, I mean, we saw technology that was applied in 2018 
but the yield result came in 19 because the conditions were favorable, I don't think, for it to show itself, but yet we saw a tremendous increase in the year after. And the reason we, we were able to do that or see that because the guy didn't put any technology on them because he said, well, your stuff didn't work. Your what but, didn't work? You were yeah. going to use a different word, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, your stuff didn't work, but it, it showed up as an eight bushel yield increase on soybeans. But it was a product that he put on in, in 18 for the corn crop. We saw a bigger plant. We saw a larger root structure and everything, but it didn't go into yield. So we did affect that plant. So I guess how Genesis Ag products are different is, is the way we're putting them together, how they can be mixed with several different things. We don't like them really mixed with fungicides, but you can mix them with starter fertilizers. You can mix them with side-dressed uh, nitrogen. You can mix them with two by two uh, fertilizers, however you want to, and they're going to be there and they're going to perform. So do you think there's more room in for the future for excitement purposes? Is there more room to be excited about where we're going as an industry in the biological world or uh, in the chemical world or in the fertility world? Well, Mike, I, I think it's all biological. As, as I said, the, the, my key component to yield is, is, is your soil biology. So do you think that we're just tapping the surface of this biological iceberg and the other sciences are pretty well developed or is there still, is there still room in, in the fertilizer world that something that could come along and change the industry or something in the chemical world the way Roundup did 40 years ago? Well, I'm sure, Mike, there's a lot of very intelligent people that, that these companies have hired and on their staff, and that's their job. That's what they're searching for. So the, the, the intellect that's there, the, the capabilities that are there are astronomical. But you think there's more low-hanging fruit in the biological world where we can see the, our most benefits easiest with the least amount of input for the foreseeable future? As I said, my, the word sustainability has probably been overused. But really, that's where we need to focus on in American agriculture. Uh, really, agriculture as a whole is sustainability. Um, we've got guys out there. Uh, some You've got friends out there. I've got friends. We've got clients that are out there that are walking a very thin line. And they're afraid to kind of go to the left or to the right because – and so they're, they're, they're trying that balancing act of staying there. And they're almost fearful of if I don't stay on the path I'm going on, I could crash. And, and I ask, is that really sustainable with that mentality? Or should we be thinking about, okay, how can I possibly decrease my inputs by 25%? and still yet maintain the yield I've been producing? That would be my question. If I was going to do that and I was really going to look, could I cut my inputs by 25%? It's much like when we are talking to someone about using our biology, Mike. I'm, I don't ask him to spend any more money. I said, let's take the money you're currently spending and look and see how we can spend it differently. And that's my approach, and, and we're being successful with that approach. We've got guys now that, that, you know, into their second, third, fourth year working with us, they're experiencing that. They, they went from trying to put on a pound to 1.2 pounds an end per bushel, that now they're around eight-tenths. We've got some guys that are at half a pound per bushel. And, well, that nitrogen's coming from somewhere. Well, I agree with you, but why not let your soil biology bring that to you? And that's what we're trying to do. So do you think that 
this change in mindset of trying to bring the biology to producers has changed your success by saying, instead of doing your standard program and then adding this on top, let's take away from your standard uh, program a little bit and then uh, supplement that with ours. I've heard you say before that nitrogen fertilizer overuse of it can inhibit biological activity. So by, by reducing that fertilizer load, is that giving your products a better chance to succeed or is this some other phenomenon that we're seeing? Well, most definitely, Mike, if, when, the, when the plant sends out brood exudates, it, it, they have a signal out. This is my belief. I can't, I can't prove it. But the root exudates have certain signaling mechanisms in there that they send certain stimulants to certain biology in the soil. And if that plant has excessive feeding of, of nitrogen, it's not going to call for the soil biology to produce any nitrogen. So if one of our key components is nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and that plant's not singing out the root exudates that call for that to work. It's much like our society. If I can get a free lunch and not have to work, just hand it to me. And that's kind of what this corn plant does. I call it luxury feeding. Then we're not getting the biological activity. So I really feel like, we're not getting some nutrient availability if that plant was actually calling for nitrogen, calling for phosphorus, calling for potassium, calling for zinc, calling for sulfur, calcium, whatever it may be. But we also got to remember, Mike, if we don't have the proper biology out there, that plant can send that root exudate out for whatever nutrient that is. If they're not there, if they're not present, to go get that nutrient for that plant, it's gonna say, okay, I sent that energy out. I got nothing in return. So I'm not going to send that exit. I'm not gonna send that energy back signaling for that. Now it may send a, a, a smaller signal to see if there's anything there that can be stimulated. But that plant is very intelligent. So, why would it keep sending that signal out, expending that energy? Because really that's taking away from yield and that plant's number one priority is to produce or to reproduce. So that's putting that into the, the grain so that reproduction cycle can continue into future generations. So is there a... Uh societal type effect with the biology? I, I heard you say uh, a little bit ago something about the effect of, uh, oh, there's something that made me think that it was like a communal type or community activity with the bugs. So if one of the key components of one of your products would be a nitrogen fixing bacteria or something like that, and we put out nitrogen, but we don't put out any FOSS, we don't put out any zinc or anything like that. Will just the, the presence of the nitrogen inhibit the nitrogen bugs, um, their buddies from showing up? This is a terribly worded question and I apologize for that. But uh, by not needing one of the bugs, does that affect the rest of them, the need for the others? This is my theory, again, Mike, it most definitely does, because when you've got a strong community and every member of that community, and that's just like the, uh, our body, if our body's functioning and we're drinking uh, five rock stars a day, which I just Six, we're up to <laughs> six. <laughs> so that's how we're stimulating our body. And, and, but really, we got our body healthy. We got it functioning uh, properly in that our, when I say our whole communal system in our body is working as balanced, we feel much better. We, I mean, you know, one of the things that everybody's really buzzing about is how do, how am I going to increase my immune system? What's the immune system of this plant? 
how are, how are we increasing it? How's, how's the soil biology aiding in increasing the immune system of this plant? How's the biology in our bodies increasing our immune system? See, we're not thinking about that. We're, but really, our, our, our bacteria and everything in our body and how balanced it is really affects our, our immune system. So your question relates to our body is the same as it does this plant in keeping that balance and that balancing act. And so if I've got a bacteria in my body that's never being used, it's going to slough off. Well, if I've got a sister or a companion biology that functions with that, that they're interacting, and that's what happens in the soil, that's what happens with our body, is they interact with each other. And so if I don't have that interaction, my defense is, is not as strong. My immune system is not as strong. And so my output is not as strong. So is there any way, once we recognize that we have a deficiency with biology, is there, what's the quickest way to address that? What's the easiest way, most effective? Well, it's not just putting the bugs out there, Mike. Uh, you know, if I was a really good salesperson, I, oh, just put our stuff out there, Mike, it, it'll, it'll be all right. So I'm not a really good salesperson, but you've got to, you've got to put your support team out there. So if I was coming into this biological world, I would really look at putting something like Carbos out there putting some uh, humic acid out there like our vitamin Terra. If that, I would call that my first step of uh, our soil primer of getting that out there. You've got native species of bacteria or you could, uh, and, and fungi out there, or you couldn't grow a crop. You've got biology out there or, or your plants wouldn't be able to function. So let's bring them up to speed and see what we could do. So, I'm saying that would be my first step is get my, my native species activated, get them going. And while you're doing that, you're building an environment so when we come in and put additional or supplementals on there, they're going to have a food source in place. They're going to have a system in place that can take them to the next level. If a guy's priming his native biology, could he be shooting himself in the foot? I mean, can we be promoting bad bacteria, bad fungi? From all of our testing, yes, Mike. Because believe it or not, in all of our testing of where we've looked at at, at, at 100 different farms throughout the all of the U.S., we're at, we're at a, 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 a negative. We're at a negative of beneficial fungi. And we're at a excessive amount of non-beneficial bacteria. But the neat thing about carbos, and I'm gonna say this, and it's a very bold statement. The neat thing about carbos is it is manufactured and put together to stimulate the, the beneficial biology more so than the non-beneficial. How does it know? You may, yeah, great question, Mike. You may ask me, okay, how does it know how to do that? There's certain sugar sources. And there's another uh, biological company out there that's much bigger than Genesis A, but they're buying carbos to put into their research studies to help to see if it will make their bacteria that they have better. They're recognizing that the, that the food sources that's in carbos are the food sources that the beneficial bacteria need. There's other food sources that the non-beneficial bacteria need. So when you look at that, this has been, when I say, and I, did, I wasn't the one that did it, but it's been intelligently designed and put together that it's for the beneficial bacteria. Doesn't mean it's probably not going to stimulate some non-beneficial, but it's really designed 
to work more with the beneficial bacteria in your soils. Kind of move that balance point more the direction we want. Yes. Yes. And can you speak to, you said that we're very deficient in beneficial fungi. Has that been an ongoing thing or is this a, a recent development? And can you talk a little bit about what you think is causing that and what we can do about it and why it's important? Well, why it's important, Mike, is um, from my reading and my understanding that a high percentage of phosphorus that goes into any plant has to go through this biological exchange. And for that biological exchange to happen, mycorrhiza fungi is probably the, 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 one of the biggest factors in that happening. And from our analysis of working, we're not seeing a lot of mycorrhiza fungi. I know there's companies out there that sell it. We, we do. But in our finding, if we don't put the nutrient with the mycorrhiza fungi, we, can, we might be able to stimulate and build a bigger plant, do a root system, all of that. But if we're not putting the, the, the nutrients out there to support it, I think that's where a lot of people are missing it. Yeah, it's very beneficial to the plant, but how do we sustain it? How do we keep it there? How do we, how do we build it? How do we get that number higher? And and I think it's it's really through, uh, you know, biological components like carbose, like phytoterra, all of those I think are are really big factors in that. And two, it's like the Revita N. That's our nitrogen fixing bacteria. It has the mycorrhiza fungi in that formula, so we know that it's beneficial. We know that it's that the levels of it aren't adequate in North America. When I've always thought about mycorrhiza fungi, I've always thought about that being more for nitrogen than for phosphorus. Um, I don't know why I thought that. Is that is a mycorrhiza fungi, is it nutrient specific or is it to go out and get whatever the plant needs? It's not nutrient uh, specific, Mike. And if you want to increase your root mass by tenfold, your, your plant's ability to feed, you study mycorrhiza fungi and how critical it is, is it colonizes on that root system. It has a way of communicating even down the road to different plants as things start affecting those plants and working with that and that entire network of mycorrhiza fungi. It can increase your um, uh, area of your plant's root system to take in nutrients and water by when I say a hundredfold because of this network that's out there. And you can dig that plant up and you can see this, this network and, uh, and how that, it's, it, that it, it, it's working in the soil. Because fungi is different from, from bacteria. Bacteria will stay with a host plant. But the mycorrhiza fungi, as it colonizes, it will interweave with, with other plants, other, with other root systems, as it goes down and, and does what it's supposed to do. So you said network. That's an interesting choice of word for that. So as we as we start growing this crop, as we're expanding this network of mycorrhiza fungi, what what are the benefits of having this network of this communication process from now all of a sudden we have plants that communi can communicate with instead of just their next door neighbor, they can talk to other plants a ways down the road. So what, what benefit is there to that? What, what would we see by having that, uh, 
what benefits would come from having that network, that communications network? As a plant may get a, a, a fungal pathogen that may hit the leaf and work its way into the, the cell of that leaf, that, that plant will send a signal throughout itself that, okay, we've had an invasion. And from my understanding, and again, this is just my understanding, that that plant, as it sends that signal through itself and through its network, that, that mycorrhiza will uh, receive that. And so it will tell the plant next to it, this is what's happening. And nature has a way of actually building that plant's immune system next to the one that's already been invaded. Whether that be a, a fungal pathogen, bacteria, insect, whatever it may be, that it has that, that way of doing that. And so what we're finding out on a very biological active farm is you get that, you're building that plant's own immune system into a higher level. It's like we talked about a minute ago, building our immune system. You're building that plant's own immune system and getting it to where it has a higher tolerance of some of these pathogens that may be introduced to it. One of the things that we, we, we that I've been really conservative and We've got some, some ideas, and when I say I'm being a little more vocal with them in 2020, because we as an industry, we've got to be more aware of what's going on. So you know, that's, that's where we are, and really our, our goal is, is to promote thought, because we really need to be conscious, and we really need to be thinking as producers here in North America, where we're going, what we're doing, and we need to have a goal, and we need to know, uh, have a good idea how we're going to get there. And so you'd like to create in the ag industry kind of a mycorrhiza network of our own that uh, can spread thoughts, spread ideas, spread experiences better. Well, sure, Mike. I mean, that's that's the key to all of this. And if you, uh, if someone finds something out, we're talking about our country, and I say our country, we, we can, again, uh, I'll throw the word out, sustainable. Agriculture's been our strongest industry uh, that, that over the years, uh, the last hundred years, it's been our really, I mean, yeah, the, there's been other industries that's been more known, but when I say we're, we can feed the world here, uh, it, that's, that's almost true. So if America is going to feed the world going forward, Genesis Ag and uh, the products that, that you guys push and promote and talk about, you think that's how big of a part of the future do you think that holds, Philip, for the average producer in America? By using the term feed the world, we've been the strongest agricultural industry. Our country has had that, the strongest agricultural uh, network that's been in the world and we have the ability here to probably uh, do more produce more uh, produce it economically whereas other countries are subsidizing their 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 farmers uh, to 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 produce um, we have the ability here with the mindset of uh, farmers in America my that we see a challenge, we go accept it, we tackle it, we, we try to do the best we can do. That's always been the ag industry here in, in the United States. So do I believe we can keep pushing forward? I do. Do I believe we need to take a different approach as we move forward? Uh, yes, I do that would be more of an environmentally friendly approach rather than a chemical uh, based approach because um, there's, there's some numbers that's been thrown out by 
some university professors that we have 60 more years of crop production here in the U.S. before we've kind of burned our soil out and extinguished our water resources. And so uh, 60 more crops, uh, yeah, I won't be here. But, uh, you know, some of the people I, I work with every day will still be here in 60 years. So am I concerned about them? Yes. Do I think we can turn this industry around? I really do, Mike. That's really why I'm here, that we can, can turn it around and we can make it where our industry is environmentally friendly. I think we're the, the answer to carbon uh, sequestering here in, in uh, and uh, so I think we could go in front of our government and say, here's what we have the ability to do in agriculture. And there'd be a lot of things solved very quickly. So I think we have a lot of potential here in, in, uh, in the U S I think our guys that we work with and, and in the industry as a whole is very open-minded and I think, I think we, we really enjoy a challenge. I think we would like to get paid for how we take those challenges on and, and how we are going to change the industry. I think the producers would, would love to do that. But, you know, we're very unique. We're very unique here in, in, in what we have the ability to do in this country. I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very excited. I'm very proud to live where we do, Mike, in the, in the U.S. And uh, I think that, uh, that we, we've got a lot of potential still yet in this industry. Well, I think that's a good place to probably close this episode out on. Is there... Any uh, any parting words? Any any quick little anecdote Philip Davis cares to share? Any any sort of word of wisdom, hope, uh, anything? Well, Mike, I don't I don't know about a word of wisdom, but uh, when I say that I'm excited as a farmer myself, I'm excited as a provider of technologies. Uh, to other farmers. I'm probably more excited this, even though um, we're facing what we're facing, I'm probably more excited right now as far as the ability of where we can take this biological world, uh, what it can, how it can actually impact the average North American farmer. I'm probably more excited today than I have been in my entire career of trying to chase this down. Some of the things we're finding, some of the things we're experiencing, I, I'm, I can't wait. I can't wait to see where it's gonna evolve, how it's gonna take us and move us into the next decade. Well, we all look forward to getting another year under our belts and getting some results back and uh, helping guide that process, hoping to get us, uh, get us all better. Mm -hmm.